What's up, everybody? Ben Raz and Matt Kajeski here, and we are back for more. It is now week one. If you're not a college football fan, you're going to be saying, wait a minute, I already saw these guys. That was week zero. I don't know why they do that. Maybe you know the answers to these things. We're going to figure that out and much, much more on this second episode of Betting You. What are we doing? We're breaking down the entire week. We've got a handful of bets for you. We're going to scroll through the board and give you what we think are the biggest edges on the board. No one better in the industry to do that than Mr. Gajeski. You're back for more. First things first, I do want to ask you quickly, what did you think of week zero? It was a lot of fun. It was pretty sloppy at times. Navy looked horrible, so it wasn't exactly the best viewing experience. UTEP looked horrible. That was a terrible viewing experience. But betting-wise, went two and three. You'll take some of that, I guess. UTEP, I, we learn our lessons early here. With Demel as coach, I don't think we can bet UTEP that's going to be a fade or pass spot moving forward. I mean, he's going to lose them more games just based on his poor coaching than any talent gap would. And then Ohio losing Rourke was pretty rough. But otherwise, fun weekend overall. Excited to turn the page to week one. All right. So the UTEP coach, I really like UTEP this year. I did not realize that it was to that level. If you watch the end of that game, I I really don't know what to say. They almost accidentally won like eight times because it looked like they were actively trying to lose. But we move on from that. We move on from Ohio, whose quarterback got hurt, which were my two key bets. I had a decent week, but my important bets all lost. Let's not bury the lead. The UMass Minutemen are undefeated and marching towards maybe two to three wins this year. How about them going on the road and and just handling New Mexico State? They were the better team. Yeah, they were. I mean, I have them on my list later today for like a betting wish list. Probably not a game we'll talk about because they took a ton of money already. I mean, it was at 38. I was trying to find a decent number in there, but it's all the way down to 35 right now. Obviously sitting on a pretty key number there. So I don't think I'm going to end up taking UMass, but I mean, the market's already reacting. Pumashan looked great. Their receivers are awesome. They did a bunch of like cool stuff with jet motions and sweeps and stuff with the receivers. Defense didn't look terrible. Pavia had a couple like really lucky throws where his receivers just outbodied UMass corners that were actually in pretty good position. So yeah, I I do think this team could win, probably go over its win total. We'll, We'll see, but I mean, they have winnable games in the schedule. They certainly do, and and they'll be maybe sneaking into the show here and there throughout the year. But like I said, we turn the page to week one. First things first, of course, if you're joining us again, this community is growing really quickly here at Odd Chopper. It's because of you guys. We appreciate it. Hit that like button. Subscribe to this channel. Be part of this as we march towards 100,000 subs, and a lot of them college football-centric. ton of content here, but we're going to – this is a little unique. Make sure, by the way, if you're watching this, And it's like Saturday morning. The timestamps are there. You can skip around to these games because some of them are on Thursday. Some of them are on Friday and some are on Saturday. We're covering all three days in one video because it's just too lawless. We'll have betting breakdowns extensively for each slate. But we start with a Thursday game. And it's a lopsided one, a monster spread. And who I'm talking about is Kent State and UCF. We know UCF at times can run it up. 36 and a half point spread. A total sitting at 55 and a half on DraftKings will bounce around to some other books and take a look. But what do you see for the first game uh, of the Thursday slate? Yeah, this is one I actually think the handicap is pretty easy on. Kent State is the worst team in college football, worse than UMass. Pick any G5 team you don't like. Kent State's worse than them. Nothing really having to do with, you know, like anything they did as a program. They just lost their head coach. He's over at Colorado now as the OC. And they got pillaged in the portal. And with Kenny Burns, their new head coach, he's the Minnesota running backs coach formerly. They just don't have the infrastructure in place yet to maybe pluck guys out of the portal themselves. So they have something ridiculous, like 20 new starters on this team. Most of them depth guys from the previous year. Transfers, they do have a really low level. So right away, I mean, this team is going to score maybe three to seven points the entire game. I think their implied team totals below seven. So nothing's coming from the Kent State side. This is basically UCF needs to get all the way to this total or or it's not going to hit. And right away, I'm looking at this UCF coaching staff and they have a new OC, Darren Hinshaw. He comes over from UAB. He's the UAB OC last year. If you watch UAB, you know that team has about a 70% run rate. So right away, I think some of the first down clock management stuff we saw in week one with the totals coming in a little lower. 
and unders pouring in across the board. This is one that's really primed for it. UCF, a run centric team to begin with, with rise Plumley, they're stable of running backs. They do have good receivers, but I don't think they'll necessarily need to use them here. They should be able to get past Kent state pretty easily. And I think even if they do put in their backups and whatnot, they're still going to be better than the players that Kent state has on the field as their starters. So I don't think they run away with it too much. And I mean, even if they do win this game by the projected spread of 37 points, this game still might come in towards the under. It's coming down. I'm seeing it down to 55 in some spots. I'm not really too worried about that. I'd still play the under here. Yeah, I just found I bounced while you were talking. I was bouncing around between a couple of different books. There's a 56 on the screen right now at minus 110. I think that's certainly playable, as you mentioned. I assume, just to put a bow on this game, I mean, you're, you're saying to the under, you have no interest in laying 36 points, right? Or do you? I don't have any interest. It's one of those situations where UCF names their score, which I typically don't love to bet, especially with them in the Big 12 now. I mean, they actually do have reasons to potentially take their guys out and not show a ton. They're going to be in a new conference and trying to make some noise. I didn't know Kent State was going to be that that bad. They they were a team we backed a lot last year. I guess I know, times so are, times are a little tougher this year. It's so sad. I miss the the good old days of Kent State. Good old Ken State. But all right, we get it started with a little under action. But there are some big games, particularly on Thursday. One of them, this could be, you could argue this is one of the best matchups of the entire weekend. And I'm talking about Florida and Utah, two teams that, of course, don't meet often. Uh, this spread has cratered. I got, I got a lot of questions here for you because I want to know what's going on. Florida and Utah, it's down to four and a half at some spots. Is that Cam Rising related? Is there other news? What do we make of this marquee matchup on Thursday? Yeah, this is definitely Cam Rising. I was lucky enough to, well, I grabbed this at plus eight in the middle of the summer, not anticipating Rising playing, but hopefully we can give you some actionable bets with the current news we have. Basically, Rising and Brant Keithy as well, which was a surprise to me. I thought Keithy would be back, but they both haven't been practicing in full. They both missed the scrimmage last week. And you're not going to get anything out of Winningham as far as injury news. But if you can read kind of what we do have is that that they're not playing in scrimmages. They're not practicing in full. I think it's unlikely that they play in this game, especially with Utah prioritizing Pac-12 championships and whatnot. This non-conference, it matters in terms of national championship goals. I'll spoil this for you guys. Utah can't win the Natty anyway. The Pac-12 means a lot more to this team than just whatever they're, they're going to do in non-con. So I do think rising is worth that much to the spread. Their backup quarterback is also hurt, so you're turning to a third stringer for Utah if that is the case. This is a team that is built on the run. Unfortunately, that's where Florida's pretty good on defense in their front seven. And conversely, Florida's a team that's definitely going to lean on the run. They have Mertz under center. I think he's still largely an unknown because of how bad that Wisconsin offense was. They, he doesn't have any good receivers to throw to, so that's a problem. But they do return a stable of running backs, Montrell Johnson and Trevor Etienne, highlighting that. They hammered the portal and brought in some really good players for their offensive line, which should be fine. And a lot of people are going to come out and tell you Utah has a great run defense. They don't. They were 74th in run defense last year, and they lose a couple guys in their front seven. Not to mention their three returning starters aren't exactly really high caliber players. So you're kind of betting on year over year ta de talent development, which they've done. But I'm not buying a massive jump from 74th in run defense to like top 10 or something. So it's a fade for me just on paper. But actionably here, I think if you're looking at the current line, I'd probably just take Florida on the money line. What, what do you think? Yeah, so. You're still getting plus money there, no doubt about it. I, I just pulled up Caesars. It's down to four there. I wanted to ask you about the total because it's really dropping as well. Uh, it's down to 43 and a half at some spots. It's going to be a low scoring game. I'm just not sure I can go under there. And then the other question I wanted to ask you, it sounds like the answer is no. And I know you already have a, a long term Florida position. Is there any number that you would buy back on Utah, say it crosses three, say Utah's down to a two and a half point favorite, or, or you just have no interest in a non-cam rising Utah team? I have no interest. I would I would bet Florida through zero if cam rising's right. out, but I would buy back on Utah immediately if rising plays. Unfortunately, you just won't know that till kickoff. Rising is so important to this team and them on, you know, like a third string quarterback against a, a decent Florida defense, a, uh, rebuilt Florida defense, but one that has really good transfers and solid returning production. I think it's going to be tough for them to score. And Florida can load the box, stop Jaquindon Jackson. 
think it's going to be really tough for Utah. This is a Utah team I was trying to sell long-term anyway, taking some unders on them in the Pac-12. Florida, I'm not necessarily buying kind of because of their quarterback situation. They do recruit really well, but I think they're still a couple of years away from actually competing. With that said, I, I do think they have avenues to a victory here. One more game on Thursday that we've got, uh, I think, is worth talking about. And then we're going to turn the page to Friday and then, of course, dive into Saturday. And we'll tell you what's going on across the industry. But last year, I backed Nebraska in Ireland, I believe. And then Scott Frost kicked an onside kick and literally destroyed the program beyond all repair. And now he's gone. New regime. Nebraska and Minnesota square off in this game. It's a seven-point spread. Another low total, 43 and a half. Can we, can we buy on Nebraska? I do this every year that thinking they're going to return to something and then they don't. What do you see in this kind of weird first game for these teams? I took this plus seven and a half on the Nebraska side. First of all, the total is really low, 43 and a half. So we're not exactly expecting a shootout. And we know what Minnesota wants to do in offense. They do replace their offensive coordinator, but they, they promote it internally. So we're not expecting massive changes there. Nebraska as an offense, I think is going to rely on the run as well. Get away from that sort of pseudo air raid. They ran at times. They're going to Matt rule. They have a dual threat quarterback. I do think this is going to be a run heavy team and all that lends itself to unders, especially with the new clock rules. But as far as Nebraska goes, a lot of people are just blindly talking about Matt rule. He just puts a culture in place here. One doesn't care about his win loss record. And they reference Baylor and temple. What they don't reference is that was before the transfer portal era. And now you look at Nebraska. All right. If he really cares about building a culture year one and not winning, why are they 27th in the portal? Why are they 25th in recruiting? Why are they bringing in all these guys and these premier players from other places? If all he cares about is culture and he doesn't care about winning games. Jeff Sims is a legitimate quarterback, former four star, good dual threat brings in Billy Kemp slot receiver from Virginia. That solid. And then a lot of their transfers come on defense where they really struggled at times last year, like two edges, MJ Sherman, cheap borders. Those guys are going to play a lot. They recruited really well in the defensive line and then their offensive line. I mean, because they had so many injuries last year, you actually have a bunch of players with starting experience. I don't think they're going to make a massive jump into like the top 50 or something, but I am expecting improvement here. Whereas on Minnesota, this team really did nothing to replace any of their departures. Ethan Kaliak Manis replaces Tanner Morgan. I think he flashed a little bit down the stretch, so I don't really view that as a weakness. But they lost Mo Ibrahim and Trey Potts. They're going to turn to veteran Bryce Williams or Sean Tyler from Western Michigan at running back. I don't love that. The running backs are pretty good, or excuse me, the receivers are pretty good, but they never throw the ball. So I don't really know what to think there. And then you lose like your three best offensive linemen Filiaga, John Michael Schmitz, Axel Rushmeyer. They're all gone. They did nothing to replace them, no quality transfers. Their depth is okay, I guess, but I mean, it's not like we're talking about Alabama here where you're falling back on four and five stars. These guys are completely unproven. Defense, you lost three on the off or on the defensive line. You lost two starters in the linebacking core. You lost two of your corners and your top three safeties. Your best transfer is probably Jack Henderson from southeastern Louisiana. This defense is going to stink. So right away, I think Nebraska might just straight up be the better team. They're going to be ironing out a bunch of wrinkles. So instead of taking money line, I'm happy to take that seven points just because of that margin for error. But I think Nebraska is a better team than Minnesota straight up. So do I actually, this reminds me not, you know, in certain facets, but we kind of talked about this same type of game with UMass and New Mexico state. Uh, and we both kind of said, we thought there was a chance that UMass was simply just more talented. They brought in an infusion of, of guys, uh, and we saw that. I, I, I kind of feel the same way here. Minnesota, I'm not overly sold on them. I think Nebraska did do some things. And it's a low total game. Those are valuable, valuable points. You want to tell me you want to go you know, over two to one on the money line? I wouldn't fault anyone for that. But I also think there's a lot of ways this game ends 24-20, uh, 21-17. And those seven points really get you there no matter what. So we're in line on this one. This one's going to be on my card as well. I didn't have uh, the first two games, but... I'm with you on Nebraska here. I assume no play on the total for you. No play on the total for me. No play on the total for me either. Okay. Three up, a million more to go. But I, I will say you've seen me juggling the books here. Uh, why do I do that? Because you want to make sure that you're getting the best line. It's so important. It makes the difference. 
between being profitable and being not. And one way to do that is to have access to a lot of books. Best way to have access to a lot of books when they offer you good time, big time bonuses, you might want to consider signing up. And I'm going to put it on the screen right now. Caesars is doing that for NFL season, for college season, or right now, like I said, just get on inside the ropes, what they're doing for new users. The link is in the description below. Take a couple minutes, sign up there. When you do, take 50 bucks and bet it on a game. Pick your favorite game. If you win, great. If you lose, all right, it's not an ideal start. What are they going to do regardless if you win or lose? $50 bonus bet each week for five weeks. $250 in bonus bets come into your account. That is a huge opportunity for you to build your bankroll, to get some bonus bets in there each week, and see if you can turn that into something that could really last you the entire season. And again, it's that simple. You sign up and you're going to get access to this. The link is below. It's on the screen. Terms and conditions apply. You got to be 21 plus. If you have a gambling problem, call 1-800-GAMBLER. But I know that that can turn your bankroll into something that you wouldn't be able to do without these type of opportunities. So shout out to Caesars for doing that uh, and take advantage of it today. Now, Thursday's in the books. We talked about three games. Let's go to Friday. We're moving down. Central, look at this, the first game. Central Michigan and Michigan State. Michigan State's a 14 and a half point favorite. We'll shop that. Let's talk about this game though. Where are you looking to put down your money? I'm very interested in Central Michigan plus 14 and a half. If you can find it, it's not available to me. And then I grab this under 47. If you can shop this and find a number close to that, I'm fine with it. I'm seeing 45 on my end and it's somewhere in there, depending on the books you shop. But basically to get into this, Michigan State's a disaster. They lose their best receiver and quarterback after spring ball. You don't really have a quality replacement at either position. I hope they start Caden Hauser. He's a four star, but Noah Kim might start. I think that's a bad decision, but that just speaks to the lack of confidence I have in this Michigan State team to actually put their best players on the field. Jalen Berger is returning at running back. They kind of add some specialists in Nathan Carter, Jaron Mangum. That's not anything like Kenneth Walker. They, these backs aren't players that can just win you games. Offensive line loses four. You lose your best player in Jarrett Horse there. You do return a fair amount of starting experience because they've been so hurt over the years. But we're talking about just average players. Nothing, I think, that can win you games. Defense lost both edges and a defensive tackle. One starting linebacker, one corner. Safety, they lost two starters. This is a team that has portaled well previously. They did a decent job this year, but I think they're starting to actually suffer in the portal rankings because of how bad they've been in recent years. I mean, I don't think any of their portal guys project a start, which is an issue for this team because they they are very weak and don't have great depth. Central Michigan's a weird team. I don't know what they're going to do at quarterback. They have two options. Bert Emanuel is basically a dual threat signal caller. I mean, they're going to run like a version of the option if he starts, but they also have Jace Bauer. They lost Lou Nichols, but he was hurt for most of last year. They got a ton of players with experience back there. They return their wide receiver two. Offensive line returns three of five, which is decent. The one place I'll say they are looking really, really solid is defense. Nine starters return on that side of the ball. So right away, the under looks a little more intriguing to me compared to the, the spread here because I just don't know what we're going to get from the Central Michigan offense. No clear signal caller. Defense is good here. And if they start Bert Emanuel, this team's going to be so run heavy. All that lends itself to the under for me rather than the spread. Might play Central Michigan if a 14 and a half pops, largely because it's going to be a slow run heavy game. But I would I would play the under instead here. I'm actually okay with 45. I don't hate that, but would love to get a better number. Yeah. So right now, just you know, again, shopping around on a couple books. There is a 14 and a half out there, certainly at DraftKings. Uh, and there's a 45 and a half there as well at minus 110. I think those love are that. both both playable. Um I'm okay with Central Michigan. I, I think that they'll be competent enough to be able to move the ball in spurts. You mentioned I think both team strengths might be defensively at times. Slash, I don't even know if it's a strength. It's just the offensive have has serious issues. This is another just disgusting game where, <laughs> I mean, how live is Michigan State to score like 21 points in this game where you need a touchdown? to get there uh, at 14 and a half. Like to me, there are, there's real equity that Michigan state hangs mid twenties point totals. Yeah. I a hundred percent agree. So I like the under, I don't know how either of these teams score. 
especially with yeah, Central yeah. Michigan being, being pretty decent on defense. It's a tough scene. Uh, I assume, <laughs> just to put a bow on this, neither of these teams are going to be any good, right? The Mac is crazy, man. I, like, if Central yeah. actually made some noise, say they start Bert Emanuel, and he's electric in that conference, because I don't really know how much you need to throw anyway. Central could do something. I don't know. That conference is just nuts. And then Michigan State, I think, is dead. Yeah, yeah. no, Michigan State is definitely not the answer. But we could jump on this early and, and see that Michigan State's got some issues. This is the next game that we're going to talk about is one of the few on the schedule where we actually can say we've seen something. Uh, and certainly the line has reacted to that. And what do I mean? Stanford and Hawaii. Stanford goes on the road to take on Hawaii, who already played. They played Vanderbilt, and I think most people came away with that they're making strides. They looked pretty good, a hell of a lot better than I thought they were going to look. And this spread has cratered. It was seven. I saw six. Now it's three and a half. Is there still some meat on the bone? And what do we do in this situation? Yeah, this is, I mean, the, it, all of it makes sense. Hawaii should have beat Vanderbilt. They had a positive post-game win expectancy. They had a punt block. They had two two other turnovers, two interceptions. Vandy returned to kickoffs. A bunch of really noisy stuff in Vandy's favor. And Vandy still only, could, they couldn't cover the spread. They won, but I mean, my goodness, yeah. Vandy, get it together. Anyway, all that to say, Vandy is a significantly better team than Stanford. Stanford is a bottom three team in the Power Five. Vandy's a little better than that. And Hawaii almost, they should have beat Vandy. Anyway, Hawaii's offense looked awesome. They got a ton out of their redshirt freshman, Pofeli Ashlock. Stephen McBride played really well, the Kansas transfer. They didn't even have their number one receiver, Jonah Pinoke, who didn't suit up for the game. Their quarterback looked awesome, passed for 351 yards. This Hawaii offense, the run and shoot seems to be working, especially against a, a defense which is better than Stanford's. The one concern I have with Hawaii is they're traveling back to the island and they get a short week immediately playing on Friday. So they lose a day and Stanford gets the extra week to prepare. They've got film on Hawaii. Hawaii doesn't benefit from any of that themselves. But Stanford, Stanford stinks, man. Like, I think three and a half is just fine here. Pretty easy handicap, in my opinion. It would be Hawaii or pass. What about plus 140? Love that. Yeah, I think for me at this point, I'm fine with three and a half, but uh, I'd actually just roll the dice. I think that Hawaii might just be better. I was pretty encouraged by that. And I really don't like Stanford. I, I We talked about this on our preview shows. Again, you can always check those out if you kind of want that. We, we both said, I, I think Stanford is live to win no conference games uh, and finish with like a potentially one and 11 or two and 10 type record. They're going to be really bad this year. Yeah, atrocious. They don't have a starting quarterback. They got ravaged by the portal, and they have really, really difficult transfer admissions. A lot of times, it's not just the academics. It's, all right, credits from, I don't know, say like Missouri. They don't even work at Stanford. So a lot of times, even if a guy is a good student, he can't get into Stanford because the credits don't transfer directly over. So they have a really hard time in the portal. They lost a ton of dudes and replaced them with basically nobody. Not good. Not good. I think they might get knocked off here. Slight upset. I'm with you. All right. We talked about kind of the appetizers. Now we move to the thousand games. I'm just scrolling wildly uh, on Saturday. Again, the timestamps will help you. I'm going to search these out as we talk about them. The first game up, I could give the people a million guesses. Uh, I can't even find the game. I'll find it while you talk about it. It's Miami and Miami. Is it not? Yes, it is. It is okay. the battle. The battle of who's the real Miami. Yes. There it is. Look at that. Oh, this game's on Friday. I'm sorry. Um, that's why I couldn't find it. Beautiful. Another Friday game. Don't listen to me, people. Go ahead. Yeah, Miami. Let's start with Miami, Ohio. They return a decent amount on offense. So you've got Brett Gabbert and Avion Smith. Gabbert's going to start, but nice depth at quarterback. Three of your top four running backs are back. That's pretty mad to me. It doesn't really mean much. None of them were difference makers. Wide receiver, you lose Mac Hippenhammer and Jalen Walker, so you return just one starter in Miles Marshall. Did add some pretty decent transfers. Joe Wilkins from Notre Dame. Gage Lavardian from Southeastern Louisiana. I don't know much about him, but he was a highly coveted FCS guy, so going to Miami, Ohio is important here. The offensive line, you lose three starters. You return four with starting experience due to injuries, but you lose some of your best players. And then the defense, you lose two starters in Ryan McWood, linebacker, and John Saunders. 
There's not a lot of experience behind them. And this defense was pretty bad last year. 94th in total defense, 99 in run D, 111th in pass rush, 76th in coverage. So returning nine starters, I think, is fine in the MAC. But when you look at the actual talent level of these players now facing off against Miami, that's going to be a huge problem. Miami's offense is going to look a little different this year. They have a new OC, which I think should significantly help them. Part of the reason this number is a little low is Van Dyke has been banged up in practice. Crystal Ball has come right out and said Van Dyke's playing in this game. No limitation, should be just fine. And I'm not even necessarily sure they need him. You have Henry Parrish and Donald Chaney back at running back. You have like five of your top six receivers back. Plus you add two four stars and Tyler Harrell, a field stretcher from Bama and Louisville. Add Cam McCormick at tight end. Offensive line is going to be nasty for this team. You've got four starters back. You had JV and Cohen from Alabama, Matthew Lee from Central Florida, and maybe the best offensive line recruit in the country in Francis Malagoa. Your defense is going to be elite. You lose one starter on the edge, one on the defensive interior defensive line, but you get solid, I guess, transfers coming in to replace those guys. Top three linebackers are back. Plus you get Francisco Malagoa, the brother of Francis. You lose two corners. Those guys were average players, but then you return Daryl Porter, Devontae Brown, Jaden Davis, Jadias Richard all come in as options from the transfer portal. Both your safeties return. Those are elite players. This defense is going to be very good as it was last year. This was a top 25 defense in the country. I don't know how Miami, Ohio scores on them just with a talent gap. And then if we're expecting a vast improvement from this Miami offense, and I mean, they have nowhere to go but up. They were 93rd. I think they just absolutely blow this Miami, Miami, Ohio team out of the water here. 16 and a half favorable number here. Love that. Down to 16 and a half as I was searching around at minus 110. You mentioned even in a 45 point total for this game. Well, Miami of Ohio, they could give you a seven to 10 uh, and you could be just fine. This has 35, 10 written all over it. I don't. I don't know a ton about Miami of Ohio, but I did see them play. You mentioned their quarterbacks at the beginning. It does seem like an uphill climb here. And I was a believer in Miami last year. Obviously, that didn't work. Go back to Miami this year. I think Van Dyke's going to have a good year. I'm th- I know it's Miami of Ohio and the time will tell. I think he's going to have a good year this year. I really believe in them. I like him a lot, too. And I do not. I, I Miami, Ohio is going to be a good team in the MAC. I don't want to sell them that short. Like. When they get into Mac play, don't fade Miami, Ohio, but they are severely overmatched here. Yeah, they could be a type of team that I hope they get crushed in these type of games and we can buy when they get to level of competition. That's more favorable because <laughs> losing to Miami doesn't mean anything. Just Last like year they State. did, and then they lost their quarterback in the process. So Ram. get crushed, but don't don't get Gabbard hurt. <laughs> yeah, don't don't get critically injured, please. Uh, another Mac team uh, is on the docket for us, and I'm talking about Buffalo, uh, and they're playing your boys in Wisconsin. Uh, talk to me about this game. I can't bring it up on the screen because I am in New York. Those games won't be listed for me. But you tell the people what angles you want to play in Buffalo and Wisconsin. This is one of the biggest movers since it opened. I grabbed Wisconsin minus 24 in anticipation of this. This spread should be even wider than it is now. If you can find it 27 and a half, please grab that because it's going through 28 in some spots. Basically, to break this all down, Wisconsin's got the new coaching staff, Fickle, Longo, Tressel is DC. They're going to run a completely different scheme offensively, and they have the players to do it. Mordecai comes in back to back, 3,500 passing yard years, good mobility. Braylon Allen's still there, I think. Baby Jesus, he's not running an eight man box anymore because Wisconsin's going to spread you out. Your top three receivers are back from last year. Then you add Will Pauling, who's going to start in the slot. Bryson Green from Oklahoma State. He's probably a perimeter guy. Four-star C.J. Williams from USC is depth. Five returners on the offensive line, plus Jake Renfro and Joe Huber come in. It's going to be an awesome unit. And a lot of people are worried about scheme changes here. I mean, you've got seven options. One guy can't handle the scheme change. I think you move on to the next one. And then you have teams like Buffalo to break this in. I mean, Wisconsin doesn't need to worry about this until later in the year. Defense is going to be awesome. You lose a couple of premier players like Nick Herbig and Keanu Benson, but Wisconsin rotated a ton on the defensive line last year, add some good transfers, Piotrowski, and then you get Varner from Temple. Secondary is going to be much better. Basically, everyone returns. And, you know, you lose the safety, but Hunter Wohler got hurt after two games last year, so you quietly have some experience there. Buffalo's a disaster. They have one of the worst quarterbacks in Cole Snyder. 
You do return your runners here. Again, they're going to be running right into the strength of that Wisconsin defense up front. Lost your top three receivers. Didn't do much to replace them. Lost two on the offensive line. I mean, it's hard to get transfers at Buffalo. Didn't do much to replace them. Lost both starting edges. Return the defensive tackles. I don't think it matters. Lost one linebacker, two corners, one safety. Very different looking Buffalo defense against a very different looking Wisconsin offense in the positive direction. So I love the Badgers. Would try to get a 27 and a half if you can, but fine with 28, probably stopping there. I feel like so far the theme of the show has been there, there's at least one team in every game that just has no competent offense. Uh, and a lot of them have been some of the Mac schools, but Buffalo, you mentioned just serious issues up and down the roster and good luck running into that Wisconsin front. So uh, inside four touchdowns, try to get that again. I'm in New York, so I cannot. But now we change it up a little bit. And what I mean by that is, A, unless I'm wrong again, but I'm not, we're going to Saturday. Uh, and B, this is the first game that we've talked about to me that could be a little different in terms of kind of the profile of the game. And I'm talking about Texas, San Antonio and Houston. It's a 60 point total. It's a one point spread. So this is a toss up type game. We know that UTSA has serious experience uh, at a lot of key positions. Who are you backing in this really competitive matchup? I like Houston as a dog. I actually bet one and a half and then I was able to find it two and a half later. So I re bet it again. Obviously fine with one and a half if I already took that. But I think people are selling Houston moving into the Big 12 and trying to buy UTSA. But there's a lot of factors here that has me leaning Houston's way. I think they might be just the better team in a lot of aspects of this game. Both of them, I think, have pretty decent options at quarterback. Obviously, everyone knows Frank Harris. But Houston, they go and add Donovan Smith from Texas Tech. He's a Houston kid. He actually played a decent amount for this team and wasn't bad. He has good mobility. I mean, is, he should develop more as a passer, and he honestly might be working with a better receiving core. We'll get into that. Running back isn't really a key component of either of these teams. Kavorian Barnes returns for UTSA. Houston adds Tony Mathis, but they also get Brandon Campbell and Stacey Sneed back. Receiver, I think, might actually be an advantage to Houston. This UTSA team lost Zachary Franklin. DeCorian Clark is coming off a torn ACL, and he's a game-time decision. He's not actually. That's not how ACLs work. He's either ready in his rehab or he's not. The Houston team just doesn't want to tell you. Game-time decision is not positive to me. I do not think DeCorian Clark plays. That leaves just Joshua Cephas from that elite wide receiver trio. And the other two starters project to be Willie McCoy. He's from Kilgore College, a transfer coming in. And Tyke Ogle Kellogg, who's been their longtime wide receiver four. You parallel that with the Houston wide receiver core. You have former four-star Matthew Golden. Samuel Brown and Joseph Manjack have played. But you get Joshua Cobbs from Wyoming and Stefan Johnson from Oklahoma State. He's another borderline four-star kid. Offensive line definitely favors Houston. You've got four returning starters and then two players that have previously started, like Ruben Inige started in 2020. You go back and look at Tank Jenkins. He started in 2021. You also add like former starters from some programs. Shamar Hobdi Lee started at FIU. Max Bain started at Akron. They have six transfers on the offensive line who could fill some of those gaps that they lost. And UTSA, their offensive line was so banged up last year. I'm not sure what to make of these players. They actually have seven guys returning with starting experience. But if you look at like, PFF grades, only one of them graded out as an above average starter. This unit was pretty shaky, 95th in pass blocking. And luckily, Frank Harris has the mobility to get away. But I do not think this is a strength for this UTSA offense overall. And then Houston's strength on defense is their edge rush. Even losing some of those guys like Atlas Bell and they lost a few others. They still have Nelson Caesar back. They have a couple of transfers coming in. Brandon Mack from Old Miss. David Abueglu from Oklahoma. The interior returns everybody. That's going to be a strong unit, and I'm not sure UTSA is going to be able to run on them. And then in the secondary, I mean, Houston has a ton of transfers coming in, but again, UTSA down two of those top receivers. How much juice do they have to throw over this Houston secondary? So I love this Houston team as a dog right now. I think people just ignoring the fact of Houston returns a decent amount. UTSA loses a lot of really important contributors here. This is a, yeah, this is a fascinating game. Uh, I'm over on Caesars. There's still a plus two, minus one ten right out there. Uh, so no problem grabbing that. And, and you did mention, you know, the loss of Tune 
would be a lot more impactful. But I really like Donovan Smith. Uh, I was a big fan of him. So I, I don't see a ton of drop off for Houston's offense, a 60 point total. I think Houston would be able to score here. And I, I actually favor them as well. Not an upset in my book, but Houston with the points or just take, you know, if you can get like plus 115, uh, save some Vega and just take them on the money line. I think that's totally fine. Back, we had one game and now we're back to the Mac. Back to the Mac, <laughs> Wall State and Kentucky, another lopsided, lopsided spread. Uh, it's near four. Yeah, 26 and a half is on my screen here. Pretty simple. With a 49 and a half point total, can Kentucky cover that number? Does Ball State do anything to cause any problems? I don't think Ball State does a lot to cause problems. If if I were to rank my teams in the MAC, you know, like the ones I'm fading, I guess I should rank the teams I'm favoring. It would be Wisconsin first. That would be the first team I bet against a MAC school. Kentucky would be second, and then Miami would be third. We did Miami first just because they play first. But anyway, Ball State's a disaster. They're moving to Lane Hatcher at quarterback. He was the 14th graded quarterback in the Sun Belt out of 17 last year. He has no mobility, negative 144 career rushing yards. You lost your best player in Carson Steele. And then I don't, this can't possibly be true, but they listed Vaughn Pemberton as a co starter with Marquez Cooper at running back. Marquez Cooper was the second highest graded running back in the MAC behind only Carson Steele. Why in the world would you split carries with Vaughn Pemberton? If they actually do that, their coach should be fired immediately. <laughs> you lose your top three receivers. You don't replace them with anybody. The best transfer they brought in was a backup from Colorado. You have both your tight ends back. That's awesome. They're going to play 12 personnel a ton. That is not going to work against Kentucky's defense. We'll get into that in a little bit. You lost three starters on your offensive line. And then interestingly, they didn't list one of their projected starters on the depth chart, Tommy Lorenz. Makes me think he's probably injured. So really, you're losing four starters in the offensive line. The defensive line here should be fine, I think, for Ball State. You basically return every one of consequence. You you do replace one of your safeties and one of your nickels. That's what I really want to focus on here. Kentucky's changing OCs, and they're going back to Liam Cohn, who basically made Will Levis into a day two pick and developed a ton of those receivers runs a very different offense from what they had last year they're going to throw the ball downfield and attack this weakness for ball state you have devin leary replacing will levis i don't think that's a downgrade you know how i feel about will levis at running back you definitely upgraded ray davis from vanderbilt demi sumo kongbai from nc state he'll be depth your top three receivers are back you lose just Tayshawn Manning on the offensive line. So you got five guys with starting experience here, not to mention some good transfers like Tanner Bowles from Bama, Cortland Ford from USC. It's an Ohio State kid and a West Virginia kid in there. Defense is going to be awesome here. You're very strong up front. You have two edges with experience. Defensive tackles, you've got three with experience. You do lose DeAndre Square at backer, but two returners there. Corner could be a slight issue. Lose Carrington Valentine and Kedrian Smith. They hit the portal there. But again, I don't think this this Ball State team is equipped to throw over you. They're, they're going to try to run through the strength of this Kentucky defense. And I don't think they score a lot of points. So it's Kentucky or pass for me. I like this through 28, 26, I think is a very generous number. Unfortunately, I missed 25 and a half yesterday. But I think this is a blowout in favor of Kentucky. Yeah, I mean, it's hard to push back. First of all, Lane Hatcher. Uh is on the Perry Ellis of Kansas plan. Lane Hatcher has been playing college football for a real long time. Remember him at Arkansas State? That's the same guy, right? Yeah. I, I, didn't he play at Texas State too? Yeah. Or North Texas while. or something? I think it was Texas State. No, I'm pretty sure it was Texas State. And then that staff got fired. And they brought in the Texas State. Now you got me on a tangent. Texas State is going to give up like 75 points a game this year. And they still might win some games. They brought in the the crazy staff. I'm pretty sure from Incarnate Word, but it's going to get wild down there. Texas State, keep an eye on them. Definitely keep an eye on them. Do not keep an eye on Ball State. No, you don't need, you can go blindfolded for Ball State. It's going to be bad. 26 and a half, that's fine. Uh, let's talk about more blowouts. Let's talk about, <laughs> I asked you about this and you were just like, well... I don't know about this because they have a real game on deck, and that is true. And when I say a real game, like a marquee game. But I'm talking about Texas because I looked at this game against Rice, and yes, it's 35 points. There was some 34 and a halfs out there. Again, oddshopper.com. Make sure you're shopping that. 
uh, and you're taking advantage of everything. The link's in the description along with that Caesars promo and our Discord and all that's good stuff. Make sure you are taking advantage. Texas, I feel like this is going to be 59 to 10 uh, at worst, honestly. I don't understand how Texas doesn't walk backwards into 50 points here. I know that they've got Bama on deck. I know that they're going to go super vanilla. The talent disparity between Rice and Texas is so immense. And I just think Texas offense is so loaded on two deep, three deep. I don't do this a lot. I'm going to lay five touchdowns here. I think Texas destroys Rice. Yeah, I mean, you're talking to a guy who's laid three plus in a couple spots this week with against Mac schools. Yeah, I, I agree with you. The only thing that worries me is just Texas against Bama, but even then they still should be able to name their score here. Sark is kind of playing for his job, whether you agree with it or not. So I, I don't think he has a lot of room for error. Like Rice, it would still look bad for him if Rice covered this spread. Like if Rice plays Texas semi-close, then you have more talking points against Sark. I mean, the, the roster comparison isn't even close, so I don't think we need to spend time on that. The only thing that worries me with Rice is I think their team is like sneaky for back doors. If Texas were to take their foot off the gas, JT Daniels is there. They had Matt Sykes from UCLA and Luke McCaffrey is still there. Tight end Jack Bradley. Offensive line should be decent. Their defense is going to suck though. So, I mean, Texas can absolutely run up the score as far as they want. But Rice actually pretty sneaky pass rate 55th. They're not the slowest team ever. Just hope that Texas actually cares long enough into this game to not have rice backdoor this. Yeah. I mean, rice gave up 66 points last year to USC. Uh, They gave up (laughs) 56 points to Charlotte. That's even worse. Their defense Um, is horrible. Like I don't think that their defense is going to change much from last year to this year. And I just think that if Texas scores 55 to, you know, that's, that's enough. I will live with it. If you give up three touchdowns for rice, I also think If you want to go another route, I'm fine with over 59. I think that Rice can get to 10 to 14, no problem. And I think Texas hangs 50 plus. So if you want to do it that way, and you're talking about the back door with Daniels and maybe Rice can get a few, that's only going to push Texas to score more. Because if Rice scores between 10 and 17, Texas will score between 45 and 60, in my opinion. The one thing I like about Texas, too, is when you pull your starters, you have really good players behind some of these guys like Arch Manning. I think Cedric Baxter might play more than we think, but I mean, he's a five star running back behind like Worthy Mitchell in in Whittington. You've got John Tay Cook, DeAndre Moore, like really good players. You have Isaiah Nayer. I don't know if he's going to start or not, but I mean, he's a starting caliber player like Ryan Niblett, four star. Behind Sanders, you have good tight ends, really deep on the offensive line. So this is kind of like USC where. I mean, we saw that young kid, the name escapes me for the sec, this Zachariah branch. Like you're going to have guys like that for Texas playing with your second team. Yeah. And we saw what that guy did. He had like 300 all purpose yards uh, because he's just more athletic than anyone. Now he's on USC, of course, but like Texas will have guys where they can throw them in and they would be the best player in terms of athletic on, on Rice's team. Like I just don't see this being not even uncompetitive. It's going to be a beatdown of epic proportions. I'm not going to spend <laughs> any more time on this than we need to. We've got a couple more games left. And I do want to say a couple things. First off, if you're scrolling through and you say, what about the, the game? And we didn't get to it. Well, we, first of all, you can always ask us on Twitter at jazz as DFS at Matt underscore Gajeski. We're around, we're available. And then this is betting you. This is a full deep dive each slate because he's a crazy man. Matt Gajeski will have, a best bets video for it. So the Thursday games, the Friday games, the Saturday games, the Sunday games, we will be there. He will be there dropping some picks, summarizing the slate for you guys. So it's all available on this odd shopper channel. That's why we want you involved again, like button, subscribe. It means a lot to us. There's another sneaky game, a totally different game than we were just talking about, but I want to ask you about North Texas and Cal, not a game that you would think would be at the top of, of a list, but to me, This is legitimate. You talk about the power five. Cal is awful too. Maybe they're not to the level of Stanford, but they're really, really bad this year. And I'm just not sure what to make of them being upwards of a touchdown favorite on the road. Talk to me about this game, a 54 point total. And I think it's going to, I'll tell you right now, I think it's going to stay very, very competitive. Yeah, I do as well. The only thing that has me hesitating is the number at six and a half. 
have seen some buyback on Cal at this. So I'm just crossing my fingers that I could get a seven. It's not available to me. I'm in an illegal state for those of you that don't know. So if you're in a legal state, you could probably find seven. I would take that just fine. I know this is one of your favorite bets. So I tried to do a deep dive on it this morning and I'll let, I'll save a lot of the analysis for you, but Cal, I mean, they retain their coaching staff. They have a new OC and Jack Jake's Babbitt all from, he's the former Texas state head coach failed there. So, I mean, it's not really something that excites me. Sam Jackson's their new quarterback from TCU has had a ton of struggles passing the ball. He's a good runner, but that's going to be an issue. Strength of your team is your run game. Jaden Ott's there. I, this is another situation where I don't know what this team is doing at receiver. You lose J. Michael Sturdivant, but you do have Hunter back. From there, you listed Monroe Young over your former four-star Marvin Anderson. I have no idea why you're doing that. You listed Tron Grizel, who I don't know, over Brian Hightower and Taj Davis as your other starter. A guy, if they trot out these three receivers as their starters, like you're just asking to lose. I have no idea why they're doing this. You lose your starting tight end. You lose you essentially lose like your best offensive lineman. The guys you return are atrocious. Ben Coleman was by far the best offensive lineman. He's gone. You do add like Matt Wyckoff from AM and, and Barrett Miller in the portal. But I mean, how much better can this unit really get? They were 122nd in pass blocking and 125th in run blocking. Your defense, I think, is going to really struggle here. You do return guys, but these are really bad players. Like below average, all three of your defensive linemen on the interior. You're basically hoping that David Reese can fix your edge problems. You lose your best linebacker. Jackson Sermon's back. He's the best player on this defense. But then at corner, you lose your best corner. He's gone. You lose your best safety. I mean, like, I don't. North Texas should actually be able to score here. Weirdly, they're the home team. I like what they have at quarterback. Like Chandler Rogers was surprisingly pretty good at Louisiana Monroe. Stone Earl is there. He hasn't really shown much. He's a former Abilene Christian guy. But then at receiver, you lose just Jair Shorter. You return four of your top five. Tight end, I don't think matters a ton here. This team's going to try to spread you out and throw with receivers. So I actually don't think they use a lot of tight ends. And just for reference, like they have a new coaching staff. So... And, and this probably fits what they want to do a little more losing Varquise gums. I mean, they weren't going to use him that much anyway. Offensive line. I think is going to be fine here. You return four starters, get some good transfers. Ethan minor from Arkansas state, Georgia tech transfer defense is solid here. I think up front, there's a couple questions, especially on the edge group, but you return your top two defensive tackles. Those are both good players and linebacker. Kevin Wood is back defensive backfield. A lot of guys return some from injury like Logan, Logan Wilson, they barely were able to like play him at times. John Davis, he missed almost all last season, started in 2021. So you have more guys back than I think the start sit column would indicate. It's a decent North Texas defense. So I'm with you just waiting on that number. Yeah, I, the number certainly could be a little better. I, I just look at this and I, I think North Texas's front has the advantage. I like Chandler. You know, you mentioned the Louisiana Monroe transfer, and he's a fine passer. He can move, though. I've sadly watched a good amount of Louisiana <laughs> Monroe football. Chandler Rogers is not a statue. Uh, he's not Lane Hatcher out there. He, he, he has can, like 700 career rushing yards yeah, or something. He can move. He can absolutely bring some dual threat ability. And the difference, because uh, you mentioned Cal's quarterback can move, too. North Texas has competent guys on the edge. They have some guys that return. You mentioned uh, the strength of that defense. I actually think it's up front, right up the middle. They've got some guys that grade out really, really well there. The secondary is kind of a mystery to me, but I'm not worried about it. Cause if Cal throws on them, so be it. I, I don't see that as a serious <laughs> threat. I really don't. And you're going to give me six and a half to seven. I'm fine with this. This should Cal should just never be a, a six and a half road favorite. I don't care who they're playing. Give me North Texas in the points here. I'm holding a Cal under. If they lost this game, that would be massive. Also holding a Cal under. Uh, if they lose this game, we can go to the window pretty early because they're not getting. I think they have to get to like five, I think. I don't even know. I've got five is. and a half, dude. I took it in. Okay, June. well, that's not happening. That's That would be a couple teams that have to get wiped off the face of the earth because Cal's not getting to a bowl. Now, there are, we talked about some pretty decent games, but the big game, I think it's pretty clear that the biggest game uh, of the weekend, national title implications, is on Sunday. There are three games on Sunday. The last one is Florida State and LSU. Uh, it's a pseudo-neutral field, 
but it's not actually a neutral field. I believe it's in Orlando. Um, if that's wrong, just tell me. Two and a half point spread. 56 and a half point total. Tigers or Knowles? What are we doing here? I bet LSU minus two and a half. That was before the Mason Smith news. The spread hasn't moved, and I'm honestly still okay with it. Obviously, you'd love it if their star defensive tackle played, but they're very deep, and we can get into that. But Florida State, I mean, like this team was pretty up and down at times last year, despite significant improvement. And I love this team. I'm going to back them a lot in the ACC, but they're they're facing one of the best teams in the country here, which is going to be tough for them. I mean, this Florida State team almost lost to Oklahoma in the bowl. If you heard the way the industry talks about Oklahoma, you think that team won, you know, like three games last year. But <laughs> ultimately, I think that speaks to how close Florida State is to some other teams and the gap between them and LSU. But LSU is a returning signal caller, Jaden Daniels, excellent rusher, very, very solid with the ball. He doesn't pass deep a lot, but he doesn't make mistakes. He only had three turnover worthy plays all year. I'd love if he took a few more risks, but ultimately, I don't know if he has to. He's got elite receivers like Malik Neighbors, Jerry Jenkins, Brian Thomas, Kyron Lacey. They add Aaron Anderson from Alabama. They have four four star freshmen passing the ball underneath and letting your just monster receivers work with the ball in their hands isn't necessarily a negative like he doesn't have to take as many risks because of the receivers in his offense backfield should be upgraded you add logan Diggs from notre dame absolutely love that offensive line is elite you return all your starters except anthony bradford injury allowed five of these guys to get experience mason Lund lunsford comes over from maryland he started there so you've got like six guys that can start for you you do lose some edge players but i mean Okay, you lose a couple edge guys. You still have Harold Perkins. You have Ogi, Ovi Oguafu from Texas. Savion Jones on the edge. Interior still is Makai Wingo, even though Mason Smith isn't going to play here. You had a ton of transfers on the interior. You had Omar Spates at linebacker to complement Greg Penn and Perkins. Your corners you lose, not necessarily massive departures in my opinion, like Jay Ward was a below average starter. Makai Gardner, Jarek Bernard Converse, average starters. You add Douche Chestnut from Syracuse, Denver Harris from AM. I think Javian Toviano is going to play. He's a four star freshman, top 60 player. And then you return Major Burns and Greg Brooks in the secondary at safety. It's going to be a really good unit across the board. Florida State is a similar returning quarterback in Travis, good runner, solid passer, really took a step forward la there last year. Treshawn Ward and Lawrence Toafili are great running backs. Receivers upgraded with Keon Coleman coming in to join Johnny Wilson. Jaheim Bell as well at, at tight end. But I think this offensive line's a little weaker. You lose two players that were pretty good there on the board across the board. And then you are going to rely on some transfers like Keandre Jones, probably going to start for you, or Casey Roddick. You have four returning starters there. Defense is where I do have some concerns for Florida State. You lose Derek McClendon and Malcolm Ray up front. You do return Jared Verse and Patrick Payton, but it's not quite as deep. Fabian Lovett's still there as well. Linebacker should be good. Corner, I think, is upgraded with Fentrell Cypress. But you just have slightly more talented and deep players, I think, really across the board for, for LSU, especially on defense. Where I think Florida State might have the edges in the secondary, but I don't think it's very clear here. And this LSU offense, going to be very strong up front. I think they have more ways to win. Whereas I have a couple questions with this Florida State offensive line. So I'll I'll take LSU here. Fascinating game. Uh I wish you I wish you good fortune uh in the wars to come. I am not betting LSU. I'm not betting Florida State either, most likely. This is a I can't wait to see it game. Maybe I'll take a position live. I'm more worried about LSU secondary than I think maybe you are. I don't know what they're gonna do there. They've got some new faces from what I read. Denver Harris is not gelled well. I don't even know if he's going to see the field. The guy from Southeast Louisiana. Maybe. He's the biggest I question. I don't think Denver Harris is going to see the field either. I think the okay. three corners are going to be Zai Alexander. He's the Southeastern Louisiana guy. Deuce Chestnut from Syracuse and the freshman. Yeah, and apparently the freshman, I mean, I don't know if he's Stingley, but he's supposed to be real good. Um, I don't know. That's that's going to be interesting because I, I like Florida State secondary. They've got some unproven pieces, particularly Florida State's offensive line. That freaks me out a little bit. If you're backing them. I, I think they could get walloped. Uh, it would help LSU, as you mentioned. Their stud up front was playing, but we'll see on what these teams put together. Great game, though. One to keep your eye on, even if you're not betting it. 
We're going to give you one more. We're going to go to the Monday game. We're going to do some best bets at the end. And again, if you have any questions on any of this stuff, make sure that you're hitting us up on Twitter. Make sure that you're keeping an eye out here on Odd Chopper. And then last thing, just going to tell you one more time, make sure you're taking advantage. You have the opportunity to get those five $50 bonus bets with Caesars in that link below description of this video. It's simple, it's easy, and it's certainly profitable. Clemson and Duke. It's the Monday game, Labor Day game. And I might walk right into the trap here unless you tell me not to. Is Duke, I mean, I know it's a, a competitive road game, but like, is is Duke that good to be inside two touchdowns? Duke's pretty good. I, I think yeah. this is, first of all, going to be slow and defensive. Both teams strong on defense. So I think you have just some game environment things that would favor a tighter spread here. I kind of want to play Duke at 14 if we can get it. But overall, I guess the Duke side is probably the, the best place to start here. The, almost their entire offense is back. The biggest question for them is going to be on the offensive line. They returned three starters and one other player that had about 265 snaps. So you have like three and a half transfers, four guys with experience. You do add Jake Hornibrook from Stanford to potentially fill that role here. But offensive line is the biggest concern for me. Running backs, receivers, quarterback, and Riley Leonard all back here. Defense, I think, is going to be really good. You have three, you have essentially four edges with over 300 snaps, and a couple of those guys are over 500. Your interior is entirely back for the interior defensive line. You lose just Shaka Hayward at linebacker, two returning starters. Corner, you lose Daytron Young. He wasn't a particularly good starter anyway, and you have three guys that have experience behind him. Lose Darius Joyner at safety. That's by far the biggest loss, but they still have Jalen Stinson. They moved Terry Moore from running back to safety, and Isaiah Fisher-Smith has started games. So it's a very strong defense. The questions with Clemson have always been offensively, and now you're going to rely on Garrett Riley essentially taking the same group and bringing them from 58th overall to whatever heights he could potentially get them to. But there's still questions like Klubnik. He's basically a new starter. He didn't play much last year. Your receivers have all been really lackluster despite being high recruits. I think your starting group is going to be Antonio Williams, Bo Collins, and Adam Randall. Maybe Spectre or Stilato pop up. I don't know. A couple four-star freshmen too. But none of those guys other than Williams has really lived up to expectation. If you just use Will Shipley and Phil Maffa, I don't think they're dynamic enough to beat a Duke defense, which is pretty good. Offensive line here is a question. They they lost Jordan McFadden, who's one of their best guys. They're decent there. I mean, this team was 57th in pass blocking, 51st in run blocking. The players, they all return are about average. And then, I mean, on defense, Clemson's going to be elite here, really across the board. I don't think we need to dive into each individual position. They basically have all their starters back, and the players, they lose. They were hurt at times. So, I mean, the players that replace them all do have time on the field. So I'm expecting a low scoring game environment, two good defenses across the board. I think Duke might have the more experienced offense overall. So I want to take 14. The under is already cratered. So I'm not sure that's the best play here, but I think it would be either Duke at 14 or pass or under if you could find like a 56 or pass. Yeah, there's some 55 and a halfs out there. Again, oddshopper.com. You can quickly shop the lines. We'll see what, what comes up. You mentioned Clemson's. Clemson's defense, those linebackers in particular, they're so good. Beast. So good. Like just elite, elite, like maybe the best tandem in the country. Uh, I want to see what what they can really do. I'm interested to see this team. We we saw Club Nick a little, but it's his team now. I, I want to see what Clemson looks like. I'll have an eye out certainly on Monday for this spot. But all right, we've gone through a bunch of games. We've done a bunch of things. We've told you about promos, told you about deals, told you about Odd Chopper. Let's recap it real quick for the people. Any games that we've talked about that you want to highlight? Or if you say, okay, just keep an eye on. We didn't get to these two or three games. They also are worth checking out. The floor is yours. Give us your best bets recap. Yeah, last year I used to have to do like the rapid fire rundown. But now I'll be doing a betting video for each of these slates. Yes. So we'll... We'll talk about all the games we missed here. So I'll leave the, the cutting room floor section to those <laughs> extra videos. Favorite bets for me, it would be Wisconsin, anything under 28 against Buffalo. Again, we're going to be fading them at card. Kentucky minus 26 against Ball State. And my last one would, would be Houston plus two and a half. If you can find it, it's down to two and one and a half in, the, in those spots. 
I bet Houston multiple times all the way down to one and a half. Think money line is fine there. Those would be my top three. I'm going to certainly agree with you. Uh, I like Houston quite a bit as well. I'm going to bet. I know I'm betting Texas. I don't care. No one is talking <laughs> me off this ledge. I do not care. They can make the spread 50 and I'd still bet it. Uh, and then I'm just in the, uh, I guess, the Texas theme because I think that North Texas is very, very live against this Cal team. Give me the six and a half. If I can find seven, even better. And let's see. I will say that to me, week one is kind of unique. There's a lot of weird stuff that goes on. Uh, and we're so excited to get into it. I'm just seeing on the screen right now, they've got those look-ahead lines. A&M and Miami, Texas and Bama. There are big-time games upon us. And certainly, you can guarantee that we're going to be covering them from every single angle here at Odd Shop. But we're going to bounce on out of here. For week one in the books, thanks as always for tuning in. Check us out, YouTube, podcast, anywhere you get this information. Uh, it'll be there for you. And good luck this week for me, for Matt, and for all of us at Odd Shopper. Enjoy week one football and come back next week. Same time, same place.